Hey professionals, so I'm making this video here because I'm seeing this one really easy and simple trick that a lot of editors are missing out on using, which saves me about 30 minutes on every project that I work on. And so I just wanted to showcase what it is that I'm doing and how you can do it too. And what I'm specifically talking about here is setting up projects. So when we think about setting up projects, we, there's a lot of needlessly time expensive settings we have to adjust. If for instance, if I go to create a new project here and I click here, so immediately we already have to come up with a name and then we've got to choose the sync media settings and all the blah, blah, blah stuffs. So now that we're in here, we now also have to go across and change all the project settings. So if we go to project settings, we're starting off with the master. There's always a couple things here, like I've always got to change these to 25. And then the color management, maybe we need to change these to something else. Another one I have to do all the time is this transcription. So if you want to transcribe and create captions for your clients, we have one word shop at a time. I have to change this from three seconds to zero so that DaVinci Resolve doesn't put two little words together in one little clip. You want them separated out. So it's just like all these annoying and time consuming and tedious tasks. So there's a way where you can actually just set up all these settings once and then save it as a template. And I'm talking about DaVinci Resolve project files. So let me just show you what that looks like here. So every time I have a new project, whether it's for a client or for myself, and in this case, I'm going to be showing you how I set this up for my own YouTube videos. The first thing I do is I go into my little universal assets folder and I've got project templates. And then here we can see YT template latest version number. That basically stands for YouTube template. So this is the default template that I use for every single project I start with. But before I click on this, the first thing I need to do is make sure I just open up the, my project data management base and then just make sure I click into Orson Lord. So this is my folder here for all my videos. And then I can just double click here and I'll give this a name. So you'll notice here that I use like a serial number for most of my projects. I just work on so many videos that if I use a title, they all get mixed up. But if I use serial numbers, it keeps communication with me and my assistant editor very clear. So in this case, I can just put an OL underscore. And if this is the latest project, it'll be one after 56. So project 57. And then I can just simply hit import. And so with this loaded up now, you'll see there's this huge amount of stuff already done. So if we go in here, we have these timelines. And so this is the main default timeline I use. And it's immediately got a few things in here, such as color coded dialogue, sound effects and music. So I was just to import a quick little asset here with my sound effects. And if I put these down here, you'll see that we've got these color codes. So if I drop them in the sound effects timelines, they're orange. If it's in the music, they're purple. And if I drop them in the dialogue, they're green. I'll open up one of the projects I'm currently working on to show you another cool little automation I've built here. So this is the current project that we're working on right now. So I've done you guys a huge disservice. And there's a major thing I want to show on here, which is the dialogue. I don't know what's happening with my microphone, but it's always like negative 10 to negative 20 decibels too quiet. And it's really annoying to adjust. But if we just simply click into my fair light here, you'll see that this is the dynamic that we already have pre-saved. And I'll just show you what it sounds like. If we have a look at my voice meter just over here in the dialogue, I released snap captions a little while ago, but I didn't provide a full, pretty well leveled. It's really nice and high. And this is what it looks like without it. Video workflow guide on how to actually use snap captions. So it's way too quiet. It's not that time consuming, I guess, to set up your dynamics and your timeline and your project files and your project settings. But when you have to do all of that, on every single project that does add up to a substantial enough time that it does have an impact on your day. So just by simply creating a template project file, we double click it once and everything loads up like we want. So I just wanted to quickly show you how to go about setting one of these up. So I'm just gonna create a new project file here. Now we have a completely blank project file to work with. We wanna just go across and do all those settings adjustments as we want so that we have something that we can save as a template. Now, the first thing I would recommend doing is going into your project settings themselves. So here, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of common settings that I like to change from the defaults that help me save time down the line. So here, I'm going to change my frame rates to 25. I'm working with HD resolutions because I work with social media content. Everyone still seems to refer HD most of the time. Going into the subtitles, I'm also gonna change this to zero seconds. Now, here's an interesting one here. If you're working with timelines within timelines, instead of having the scale entire image to fit, I'd go center crop with no resizing. This is really going to be dependent on your workflows, but if you're using something like my snap UI template, 
we need to make sure that the mismatch resolution is by default set to center crop with no resizing. Here's another one that might be useful for you to look at. It's the optimized media and render cache. So if you're running on a slower computer, you usually have this setting enabled. So if you go to playback, fusion memory cache and have this set to auto, anything that doesn't play back in real time, whenever you're not doing anything, Resolve's going to render it in the background automatically so you do get that smoother playback. This is a ProRes 422HQ. If you're on a Windows machine, it'll most likely be set to like a DNX HD or HR setting. Now, these are technically the best codec files for getting really clean, really smooth playback. And a lot of the times this is actually the correct setting to have, but if you're working with smaller hard drives in your computer, very quickly, these files will fill up your hard drives. The amount of data they take per second to render out is massive. A couple projects and you'll fill it up in no time. So for a lot of us, sometimes we need to change these to H.264. When I was on my M1 MacBook Air, I would set these to H.264. It was technically not as fast on playback, but it definitely stopped me filling up my hard drive. Now, since I'm on an M3 MacBook Pro, this is totally fine. The amount of times I actually need to render something out using these settings is minimal enough that I'm not worried about the data being stored. So yeah, depending on the speed of your computer, having a little play with what's best, definitely a good option here. So with that out of the way, the next thing I really like working on is creating an organized folder structure. This is absolutely important for me because I'm working on so many projects and I'm working with other team members. It's important that we have an organized folder structure so that we can collaboratively work together and not be constantly sending messages back and forth going, hey, where's this, where's that? It's just, it is where it's supposed to be. Even if you're not working with a lot of projects or a huge team, if you're working with something that has say more than 10 to 15 assets being used, which is pretty pretty much all video projects these days, you should definitely be having an organized folder structure as it will just save you time when you go to open it up the next day. The amount of time that we can waste as editors looking for things may seem trivial and small, but it's probably one of the biggest differences between a professional editor and a beginner editor is just having organized media because we understand how much time it saves in the long run. So let's just go through my favorite folder structure settings to have. So first thing as always is I usually have a video bin and then depending on if it's a multiple shoot kind of video, I will also have another bin in here called card one, card two, et cetera. And what this means is every time we finish a shoot, we drop the video assets into the card folders right here. The next one I really like having is a media bin. So with the media bin here, there's a bunch of assets in here. So I'll create another one and I'll also have B-roll. So this is any stock footage or other shots we've recorded outside of the main shoot to add as overlays on top. I'll also have an images folder and a music and then sound effects folder. And then basically this is just how we organize all our assets into the correct folders so they're easy to find when we need to get them. And another one that's obvious is the snap captions bin. So if any of you have seen my snap captions video, it's a way of automating creating animated captions. One of the things you need to do is create this like snap captions bin. So all I have to do for this one here is I click on master, I'll open up my template files and I'll just double click the DRB file and it drops it in there. And so here you can see like I've got all my default assets and stuff sorted. So next I also have timelines. So I'm just gonna put that one in like so. And let's create a timeline now and we'll come back to bins later. There's a couple more we should think about, but let's just talk about timelines for a second here. So when I go to create a new timeline, if we just get rid of this default settings, you can see it's now doing 25 and doing everything the way we want. So we'll just hit create. I'm going to rename this to GTBT. So the first step I do in all my video projects is we actually just do a good takes, bad takes pass. So we look for all the good takes, any of the bad takes, we delete them. Roughly speaking, I would say about 20 to 30% of the footage we import ends up being bad takes. So if we're doing a 30 minute video, 10 minutes of it is unusable footage that we just know we shouldn't be looking at. And we immediately just get rid of that because we have to play back that video so many times by the time we get to the end, those 10 minutes of looking at bad footage really adds up. So that's just one of the reasons why I named a GTBT timeline. And let's just go through how I set this timeline up. So the main thing I like setting up in my timelines is audio automation. So things that help process audio to be as quick and efficient as possible, like you saw before. I always end up creating a new track here as well. Now, I personally only work with mono audio in my dialogues. I know there's some stereo systems out there, but I just set it to a 1.0 as it keeps things really simple and easy when I go to drag my audio in. If I just quickly jump over to Fairlight here, 
I'm just going to go into the dynamics and what I'm going to do is just create a compressor. So I know just personally working with my microphones, I usually end up having to need something that looks a bit like this. Now, I know this is pretty janky having my volume up so high. So for all your hyper audio professionals, I know it's not the ideal thing. It's just what works with this microphone here. And I'll just drag that down to a bit like so. And so what this is doing basically is it's allowing my voice in general to get higher than normal. And then as it gets to the point where it's about to peak and get too loud, it then starts dipping down. And what it just basically means is that my voice is more evenly volumed throughout the whole video without setting any keyframes. And what what this is doing here is it's just hiding any of the breath. So I found my breaths can be kind of subdued a little without having to create manual keyframes by just having this little gate here. And then what I'll do is I'll copy that and I'll paste it across to here. And then I'm just going to set the track name to dialogue one, and then I'll set this one to dialogue two. So after this, I'm going to add three stereo tracks, and these are all going to be my sound effects. So anytime I've got any like whoosh sound effects or or whatever they may be, this is where they go. Now I don't do any changes from the defaults with these because sound effects can be so wildly variant. They have to be manually adjusted inside each clip. So I just keep that one in mind. But what I will do is I'll highlight these three and I'm going to change the color to a different one such as orange. And then after that, I'm going to add two more stereo tracks. And these are going to be my music passes. I'm going to change the track color to purple. Now, with my YouTube channels by default, sometimes I do have background music just playing subtly in the background. So in this case here, what I usually end up doing is I'll just go inside here and I'm going to use the compressor again and I'm going to drag this down. And what I'm basically saying is like, hey, try and keep that music around that negative 30 decibels as an ideal number. And I'll kind of play that by ear a little bit, but that's generally what I do. If you're using music that isn't always going to be in the background, maybe it's jumping up to your dialogue levels, this may not be an ideal solution or something you could do is just add another track type in here with a different color where it's like unequalized music, basically. So if you want to learn more about these dynamics here and how you can best change the settings for you, I'll leave a link to some of Jason's videos. He's pretty much the Fairlight master when it comes to DaVinci Resolve on YouTube and teaching it. And you really can't go wrong with the videos he covers on these topics. So definitely recommend checking them out if you're curious about more things you can do with these. So with our timeline out of the way, let's just go back to our master bin here and I'm going to create a new bin called Compound Clips. And this is a really important reason. So if you're working with a lot of projects, a lot of the times we end up compounding things together because it allows us to save time and keep things more condensed and organized. And I just want to quickly show you what that can look like. So I'm just going to drag a few things in here. Cool. So now I've got these two images in here and you see we've got this iPad screen and then we've got this HD green placeholder image. And what we might want to end up doing, for instance, is we just decide to create a little compound clip. So we want to put these together because we're just going to adjust all the settings at once, such as, you know, maybe we might throw a little magic animate on both of them here. I'm just going to give it a little whip in. There you go. So now you see we've got that little whip in happening. Now, one of the main issues with this compound clip is that if I click somewhere else in the, any other bins and I create a new compound clip again, it's just going to call it compound clip one by default. It's extremely problematic if you're working on multiple video projects inside a single project file, these compound clips can all get mixed up and messy. But now that I have this compound clips folder with compound clip one, if I create a new compound clip, it immediately by default makes it number two, which means it's very easy to go, oh, yep, this is compound clip one, compound clip two. It keeps everything a lot more organized by giving unique names automatically. It's not something we have to keep track of. So once we've ended up creating this huge project file, how do we go about turning it into a template? Well, this is how. First thing we're going to want to do is actually save this project file as something else. I'm just simply going to go save project as, and we're going to call this template project file. Enter, and you can see up here, it's now changed to template project file. So you know we're in this new duplicated version. And this is important because the first thing we want to do before we turn this into a template is remove all the assets we're not going to be using by default. So here I'm going to be deleting my compound clips from timelines and the bins. Then if we go into our media here, I'm going to also delete this delete my images, but I am going to keep my snap captions. So when we save a project file, because these are fusion compositions, DaVinci Resolve will save them automatically. This means that I won't ever have to like add these in again. They can just stay here. So anything you have where it's 
completely built with inside Fusion, they're usually worth keeping if it's going to be a replicatable effect. So with our project file cleaned up and ready to be saved as a template, we can just simply go file, export project, and then we can save it in default. So what I like doing is I have a universal assets bin, and then I've got project templates, and then I'm just gonna call this template project file version 01.00. And I think it's really important to have version numbers as you will make tweaks and changes as you refine your processes in your career. So it's just a nice little way of keeping up to date and creating a non-destructive workflow if you ever wanna go back to like an old project style setting. Another really awesome feature you could do here is if you work with a client multiple times every month, it makes sense to create a project file for them. So here you can see this one pn underscore project four, that's actually my client's property navigation. And so I actually have a template project file because we have a very regular process with them. And this just means working with their edits is quicker every single day. So now I can just hit save. So with that project file now saved, how do we open it up? Very simple, we can just go to our database. Let's just pretend I'm working on another project for me, Orson Lord. I can then just go into my finder, go to where I've saved it. And we can see my template project file here and I can just open it up and then I can just change this to the project name, hit import. And you can see here, just like that, everything's organized, ready to go. We're ready to drag our videos into the card folder and we have our timelines already set up and our project settings are done. I really hope you found this one helpful. I really enjoyed making this video and until next time, everyone, I'll catch you around.